Okay. Um, all right, so this is the repo, fast AI paper space setup. I've started a machine. Uh, I'll cd to my home directory. I'll get clone the repo. I'll cd into the thing I get cloned. I'll run dot slash setup dot sh. Okay, and it says install complete, please start a new instance. So then I'll stop the machine. And then I'll start a machine. And um, that's going to install a prerun.sh script, which um, is going to set up all these things and all these things. And it's going to install a dot bash dot local script, which will set up our path. And it's going to also install things or set up things for installing software pip i for pip install and mamba i for mamba install. So we now have a machine running. And so we should now be to create a terminal. I just press press terminal. Mm. Nope, something's happening. Great. Okay. Try creating a terminal here then. Okay, much better. Uh, all right, so in theory, if we look at our home directory, oh, look at that. All this stuff is now symlinked to slash storage. So I should be able to pip i fast AI and get the latest version. I wonder if I can add a minus u to say upgrade. Yes, I can. So that's how I get the latest version. And so that should have installed it locally. There it is. Um, okay. So now if I create a notebook, import fastai, fastai.version. Ah, oh, look, that's a good start. Okay, next question. Can we install binaries, for example, universal C tags, member I for member install, universal C tags. There we go. So you see the nice thing about this is even all this persistent stuff we're installing into a, you know, all works on the free paper space as well. Um, so we should now be able to check C tags. Ta-da, it works. And which one is it? And that is actually in our storage. Oh. So I think we've done it. What do you guys think? Is that simple enough? It's good. All right. 
It's good. Okay. So next step is um, I thought we might try to fix a, I don't know if you call it fixing a bug or maybe it's probably, we could generously call it adding an enhancement to fast AI, which is uh, um, to add normalization to TIM models. So, um, All right, so let's grab fast AI. Now, this is where, so when I git clone this, so let's go to notebooks. So slash notebooks is persistent on a particular machine. And I think this will not work because I'm using SSH. Oh, it's already there. That's interesting. Um, oh, you know, so there's a bug in our script, which is I didn't pop D. So let's fix that. Prerun.sh. I did a push D at the start, but no pop D at the end. Okay fixed. All right, no worries. Um, that means, okay, yes, we're actually in here. No worries. Um, all right, so let's restart this. And then I'll tell you about the bug we're fixing while we wait for it. Okay. So, um, so normalization is where we um, subtract the means and divide by the standard deviation of each channel for, for vision. And that goes, that's a transform called normalize. Um, and we need to use the same uh, standard deviation and mean that was used in the, when the model was pre-trained. Um, because, you know, there is, you know, so some people, is, you know, will normalize. So it's, everything's between zero and one. Some will normalize. So it's got a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, uh, so we need to make sure we use the same, you know, divide by the same thing, subtract the same thing. Um, if you look at Vision Learner, um, Vision Learner has a normalized parameter. And if it's true, then it will attempt to add the correct normalization um, here. Um, so if it's not a pre-trained model, it doesn't do anything because it doesn't know what to normalize by. Uh, otherwise, it's going to try and get the correct statistics from the model's metadata. So the model's metadata is here, model underscore meta. Um, and it's just a list of models with um, with metadata, and the metadata here stats, ImageNet stats. So the ImageNet stats is the mean and standard deviation of ImageNet, which I can't quite remember where that comes from, but that's something we import from somewhere. Um, so none of these are TIM models. And so that means currently TIM models aren't normalized. Um, now, TIM has its own stats.
not this, not this. Um, there's a lot of stuff in TM I still haven't looked into. I actually haven't used this transforms factory. Maybe in FastAI3, we should consider using more of this functionality from Tim. Um, there's like a configuration for them. But, oh, well, I guess we can just try and find it. Oh, actually, we forgot to edit this. Oops. My bad. Letting me start the machine. Here we go. Okay. So we can just do this locally for now. All right. So this happens in Vision Learner. And uh, Tim is optional. You don't have to use it. Um, but if you do, then we have a create Tim model, which you don't normally call yourself. Normally you just call vision learner and you pass in an architecture as a string. And if it's a string, it will create the Tim model for you. Um, so there's a uh, list models, for example. Let's say conv next or something like that. I don't know what conv it is, never tried that one. Let's do it tiny. Um, so we can create a model using like create model, we pass in a string. And I have a feeling that's, yeah, that's got a config. Here we are. Yeah, see, and it's got a mean and a standard deviation. So models equals Tim dot list models. Maybe we'll just do pre-trained ones. Um, so I wonder if they all have this for M in models. So let's create a model. And have a look at m.default config um, mean. And standard deviation. Yeah, so you can see um, a lot of them use 0.5. Um, and then some of them use image net stats. And I'm guessing they're the only two options. So, okay, so hopefully you get the idea. 
Um, Jeremy, just a doubt. Uh, usually, according to imaginary, the mean should be zero and standard deviation should be one, right? Um, I mean, not necessarily. Sometimes people make the minimum zero and the maximum one. Um, um, but what we need to do is use the same stats that it was pre-trained with because we want our range to to be the same as the range it was pre-trained with. Otherwise our, you know, data has a different meaning. Um, so, so let's go to add norm. Okay, so here's add norm and it's being passed to meta stats. So, this only works for non TM. So, how about we put this here and we'll create an else, or I guess really an LF. And then here we'll have for TIM, if normalize. We could have a Tim normalize. Um, which, you know, we can refactor out some duplicate code later. Um, but basically for Tim, we're gonna be passing in the architecture. Um, oh, we don't need to pass in the architecture. We can just pass in the model. Pass in the model. And um, Uh, do, to protect against future like um, ability to pass in other types that are strings that aren't Tim, do you think there's any benefit in having like a default normalization function that if you pass through, you can actually do your own normalization? Um, no, because my answer to all of those questions is always you ain't going to need it. Um, so I okay. yeah very intentionally don't do like you know, dealing Actions. with things that may so or may not happen it, in the future. It'd be simpler just to create your own vision learner because that looks like there's not much going on there that you could duplicate if you wanted to have support for a different model um, series. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, okay. you know, um, this is just a, a small little wrapper really. You can call um, create Tim model or create vision model. You can call learner, you can call create head. Um, Yep. Okay, so we'll call that M. Um, so the normalize takes a mean and a standard deviation. So it should be just those two things, I guess. Like so. All right. Um, okay. Tim normalize using the model and pre trained. Okay.
Uh, I see I already had an else there. So I do that. There we go. And okay, so let's test this out. Um, else. So what happens when you add a transform? Um, it adds a transform to each data loader in it. Okay. So and what does that do? Oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, it's part of, I see, it's part of, okay, that's a bit confusing. Um, okay, so let's find, sometimes it's just easiest to look at the code. Add uh, trefums. I see. So it's just calling add. I see for this particular event and um, we're adding it. I see we're adding it to the after batch event. So we should find there's a after batch event. Here we are. I see and there's our transforms. So if we call vision learner, that should change our data loader. And it's now got normalize using the image net stats. And if we now try it for a string version, ah, now yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Oh, what happened differently? Oh, I see. We need to recreate the data loaders for this test so that it doesn't have normalize anymore. And that gives us, okay, that gives us an error. And that's because it says we're passing a sequential object. Okay, that makes sense um, because Create Tim model actually, yeah, modifies things. That's why. Um, and it creates a sequential model because it's got the head and the body in it. Uh, so we need to change how we do this. All right, this is. Tim body here is the model. And oh, look here, we use default config to get stuff here. Interesting. So Tim body is called from here.
I guess like it would be nice to know how Tim does this exactly. Where does that um, default config come from? So when we call tim.createModel, um, set layer config. Um, I wonder if we should take a look. Default config, it's probably going to be a lot. Here's data config.py. So, where does it get set? Maybe models help us. The old model with config. Mm. Well, Seems like this part needs some restructuring. It's not surprising. It was originally built not to expect to be doing stuff with Tim. Create vision model calls create body and create body. Here, this is where it builds, creates the model. So maybe we should change how these work. Um, so let's do some, should we think about doing some redesign maybe? Um, and so the idea of the redesign, I guess, would be that this doesn't instantiate the model, um, but it assumes it's already instantiated. So we would remove that. Okay, so that's now not gonna work, of course. So then we're creating body with model. Okay. Um, and so then we have to instantiate that. Um, so we may as well just do that directly, right?
Um, If you make this a function, so okay, it's a new one each time. Okay, so in this refactoring, um, we now are passing around models, not architectures. Create head won't change. All well, the model meta stuff doesn't change. Okay, so this changes. So now we say model equals arch pre-trained, pass in model. Okay, it looks hopeful. Um, so we're gonna do the same thing for Tim. going to pass in a model. Okay. Um, so it's going to be the same here, model. So let's see if vision learner still works. Okay, it does. Um, so maybe we should move, keep moving this back further and further. Um, So to make Tim work, we do that. And this is kind of like the body. Or maybe we'll just call that the Tim model, Tim model. Um, Oh, problem with that is the keyword arguments 
So there's a lot of, this is, this gets a bit crazy. There's a lot of keyword arguments when we create a model and the ones we don't know about, we pass on to Tim. So I think actually what we'll do is we'll do it up here. Okay. And so Tim body doesn't need quags anymore. Um, and what we might do is we'll say this is the result and we'll return those things or even return those two things. So now we've got the config. And so we can pass the config to this. Like so. Let's see how much we just broke. Okay, so create Tim model. Yes, we do pass in an architecture after all. So we just change that back. Oh, that looks hopeful. So we should find that if we create a VIT, and check its default config. Yep, that looks good. Now ConfNext Tiny, on the other hand, uses ImageNet stats. Excellent. That looks very hopeful. So if somebody feels like an interesting and valuable problem to solve, making create unit model work with Tim would be super helpful. All right, now create unit model needs to do the same thing as create vision model, which is to actually instantiate the model. Is anybody potentially interested in having a go at doing UNET models with Tim? If so, did you want to yeah, talk about it? I'd be interested. Okay. So, um, all right, let's just get this working first. All right. Uh, are you somewhat familiar with using units in general and an um, RSPI's dynamic unit? A little bit. I'm training one at the moment. That's my maximum experience. I mean, I've been through some notebooks, the walk through fast AI uh, one and everything. Great. So, okay. So um, the interesting, okay. So, you know, the basic idea of a unit is um, um, 
that it has not just the usual kind of um, downward sampling path where the image is getting kind of effectively smaller and smaller as it goes through convolutions with strides. And we end up with, uh, you know, a kind of a very small set of patches. Um, and then rather than averaging those to get a vector and using those as our features for our head, instead we go through reverse convolutions, which are things which make it bigger and bigger. And as we do that, we also don't just take the input from the previous layer of the upsampling, but also the input from the equivalently sized downsampling, sized downsampling layer. Before FastAI, all units had to be uh, only handled a fixed size. Um, what Karam did was he created this thing called the dynamic unit, which would look to see how big each size was on the downward path and automatically create an appropriate size thing on the upward path. Um, and that's what the dynamic unit does. Um, Fast AI has been uh, very aggressive in like using pre-trained models everywhere. So something we added to this idea is this idea that the downward sampling path can be, can have a pre-trained model, which is not rocket science. Uh, obviously it's like this, this one line of code. Um, um, the, um, so to understand, like at the moment I'm using say like a ResNet 34, does that mean the down path uh, is a ResNet 34 backbone and then yep. there's a reverse ResNet 34 being automatically generated it's on the not other a side reverse plus... res It's not a reverse ResNet 34. It's, it is a ResNet 34 backbone. Um, so here's our dynamic unit. The upward sample, mm -hmm. the upsampling path is, um, has a fixed architecture, um, which is, um, uh, they are indeed res blocks, um, but they're not like, if you use as a downward sampling part, you know, downward sampling a VIT, the upward sampling is not going to be a reverse VIT. You know? It's not a mirror. No, exactly. It's just a is, is, would there be an advantage in doing that or is it just not really helpful? I, I don't see why there would be. Um, I'd also don't see why there wouldn't be. Uh, nobody's tried it as far as I know. I, I don't okay. even know if there's such a thing as an up sampling transformer block. I, um, there may well be. Okay, but without uh, digressing. Um, that, that, but yeah, there's, there's, no need so, to do, there's no need to worry about that. Um, the key thing is that um, in the downward sampling path, um, what we do is we, we have the downward sampling bit we call the encoder, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we do is we do a, um, a dummy eval. Now a dummy eval is basically to take a, I can't remember, like a, either a zero length batch or a one length batch, like a very small batch and pass it through um, at some image size. And um, um, we use, I believe we use hooks, if I remember correctly. Um, um, what's happened to my screen? My screen's gone crazy. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've got these hooks, little PyTorch hooks. Um, yes, okay, so we use FastAI's hook outputs function, which says, uh, I want to use PyTorch hooks to grab the outputs of these layers. Um, and so, what is SC, CGC, HG indexes? Like, is that um, so this is, yeah, okay, so that's a great question. So this is the indices of, this is the key thing. This is the indices of the layers where the size changes. Um, right. And so that's where, you want, the... that's where you want the cross connection, right? Either just okay. before that or just after that, you know. Um, so get, get, get the indices where the size changes. So the sizes, um, here, model sizes. Mm -hmm. 
So we hook outputs, we do a dum dummy eval, and we find the shape of each thing. And yeah, so here you can see dummy eval is using just a, a single image. <coughs> um, and so, yeah, this just returns the shape of the output of every layer. Um, that's going to be in sizes. And so then this is just a very simple function, which just goes through and finds where the size changes. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and so this is the indices of those things. Um, so now that we know where the size changes, we know where we want our cross connections to be. Um, now, for each of the cross connections, we need to um, store the output of the model at that point, because that's, that's going to be an input in the upsampling block. So these SFs, for each um, unit block we create, so for each change in the index, for each upsampling block, mm -hmm. you have to pass in the, that, um, uh, those uh, outputs in the, from the, the downsampling side. So this is the index where it happened. And so this will be the yep. actual. So if we go to the unit block. Um, it looks like it's, so it's the size of that list minus one. Is that how many unit blocks get created on the other side? So the, the it, so it's got to be past the hook, right? Which is, and so that that's just the, the hook that was used. Um, hook. That's the hook that was used on the downsampling side. And from that, we can get the stored activations. Uh, okay. And so those stored activations then, um, so this is the, um, shape of those stored activations. And um, this is a minor tweak. So let's just ignore this if block for a moment. Basically, all we then do is we take those activations, stick them through a batch norm, concatenate them with the previous layers upsampling, and chuck that through a ReLU. And then we do some comms. Um, and the com comms aren't just comms, they're fast AI comms, which um, can include all kinds of things like batch norm, activation, whatever. So it's, it's a, some combination of batch norm, you know, uh, activation, convolution. Uh, you, can, you can also do upsampling, so it's transpose. Um, batch non can go first or last, whatever. So that's quite a, you know, a very rich conv convolutional layer. Um, okay, so then this if part here is that it's possible that things didn't quite round off nicely so that the cross connection doesn't quite have the right size. And if that happens, then we'll interpolate the cross connection to be the same shape as the upsampling connection. Um, and again, I don't know if anybody else does this, but this is to try to make it so that the dynamic unit always just works. That's the basic cool. idea. Um, yeah. So to make this work for Tim, um, you know, this encoder um, it needs to know about the spots, right? Oh no, it auto detects the spots. So, yeah, so so honestly, this this might almost just work. Like I don't like right. I, I don't think it does. I think somebody tried it and it didn't, right? Um, but yeah, it 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 would, you know, to 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 figure out what doesn't work, you know, you would need to change mm -hmm. this line to say, oh, if it's a string, create trim model, otherwise do this. You know, um, and then you'd like create body would need to be create dim, dim body if it's a string. So like at minimum, do the same stuff that create vision model does, and then yeah, and then see if this works, right? Okay. And it might well. Now I will say oh. if you do get it working, um, Tim yeah. does have an API to actually tell you where the feature sizes change. So like you could actually right. optimize out that dummy eval stuff, but. I don't even know if I'd bother because it would make the code more complex for no particular benefit. Yeah, sure. 
So, um, look, uh, I think if, you know, this, you, you commit this as a PR, I'll definitely be looking at it. Um, I, I was actually going to try Confnext in my unit, so I had no idea it wouldn't work, actually. Yeah. So that would have been, I would have noticed that already, but I just haven't had time. Yeah. So I'd love to because I, I, you know, okay. tried Resident 32. I've got particular results and I'd like to see if we can push it with a different model. Yeah. No, I mean, I think there'd be a lot of benefit to that. So, um, all right. So now we should run the tests. Just to, just to know, would that all likely be in the same a notebook that you're editing, the vision learner? Is that where most of the source code is for unit um, learners? Or is it a different um, um I don't know. I was just uh, using That's all right. I'll jump, find it. jump, jump <laughs> to <laughs> whatever question. automatically in Vim. So I was using Vim C tags to jump around. So I don't, I have no idea where I was. Um, no worries. Um, I mean, actually, So yeah, so there's a models unit is where the dynamic unit lives. Um, okay. So um, is there anything unique about the fact that the Tim model doesn't, oh, I saw an option there to cut the, the tail and head off. Um, does that yeah. need to be done with the unit architecture? Um, oh, got an error here. Um, yeah, so yeah, you, you absolutely have to cut the head off um, because it comes with a default classifier head. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you will need, you know, um, so you, you know, you once you get it working, you'll probably find you can factor out some duplicate code between the unit and the vision letter. Um, but yeah, okay. you basically have to cut off the classifier head in the same way that um, create Tim body does. Um, and I don't think you'll need to change any input processing as far as I know. Um, the the vision create vision model, you know, handles like, you know, uh, if you've only got one or two or four channel inputs and the model is a three channel input, it handles that automatically. But Tim actually, I think Ross and I independently invented this as far as I know, we both kind of automatically handle like copying weights if necessary or deleting weights if necessary or whatever. But yeah, so the same stuff from Vision Learner should, should work there as well. So interestingly, Great. layers, the layers notebook. Um, uh, doesn't work because it is actually creating a model, which is curious. Um, so that'll be easily fixed. Yeah, that's interesting. There we go. Okay. So uh, the big question then is, can we still predict rice disease? Let's compare. I don't know if it's going to make much difference or not, um, you know, because we're pretty careful about fine tuning the batch norm layers. Um, it would actually be interesting to see whether normalization matters as much as it used to. It used to be absolutely critical. Um,
is it possible to create like a, a layer that learns the normalization sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what batch norm does, you know. Um, to understand it's a, those weights in the batch norm layer are basically learning the aggregate of that batch that optimally give the, the best activations for the next layer. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a, you know, multiply by something and add something. Um, so it's finding what's the best thing to multiply by and add by. Um, so let's take a look. So I mean, uh, all right, so this got 47% error. It's got 44% error. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> it's a bit disappointing after all that work. It doesn't actually, I mean, this is fascinating. Like, yeah, when you fine tune the way we do, basically doesn't really matter, you know? Um, and let's just double check it actually is. It actually is working. Would it be fair to say that the one advantage would be if you wanted to use pre-trained models without fine tuning, you definitely want the statistics in there, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if that's an actual thing that people do, but yes, if you did. All right, so we did dls.train.afterbatch. Yep, there it is. Groovy. Yeah, it's funny these things that, you know, we've been doing for years and I guess never question. Um, I have a question relating to that because um, one of the things I wanted to do is get this uh, unit into a mobile app. So I used the latest Torch script and it works with the uh, demo app. I had to fiddle around a lot because it's broken from PyTorch. Um, but of course, in there, you need to provide the, the averaging statistics for the app. So it's like inference mode. Um, so I wonder, I know that at the moment, the... Fast AI's kind of idea is that you dump everything as like a pickle, um, but conceivably it would be helpful if you could maybe extract those new fine tuned uh, statistics or something for your deployment in particular um, environments. Is that, how would I go about doing that? I mean, they're just parameters in batch norm layers, you know, they're, they're just parameters. So they'll be in the parameters um, attribute of the model. Um, but like they're not they're not really parameters that make sense independently of all the other parameters in the model. So I don't think you would treat them any differently. If, to... if you use say ImageNet's uh, statistics when you're fine tuning, then that's the result of your model, right? You're going to use that down the track as well. Well, yes and no. Like that's what you normalize with, but but you've got batch norm layers, which then obviously. A, a, Dividing and subtracting, you know, themselves. So yeah, I mean, your your those normalization stats aren't going to change, but there isn't really any reason to. You know, you're, it would only be if you, um, uh, trained a new model from scratch. Um, I just want to have a look at this conf next one. So this is twenty seven to eighteen. 24. Yeah, this is actually kind of what I thought might happen is on a slightly better model, you know, we may be getting slightly better errors initially, but then as it trains a bit, it makes no difference. Um, cool. All right, so um, yeah, I'd love people to, um, try out fast AI from master because um, tell me if any of your models look substantially better or even more important, substantially worse. Um, Auto normalize Tim models. Okay. Fixes three, seven, one, six.
All right, anybody have any questions before we wrap it up? So just with normalization, as you said, it's just the initial uh, error rate will be a bit more less than the earlier approach, right? Yeah, After so like that, 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 you know, well, at first you have ra a random head. So at first it doesn't actually matter, right? It randoms random whether you normalize or not. Um, so maybe, you know, the after 10 batches, it's better or something. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, it'd be interesting to see if anybody notices a difference. <laughs> I mean, this just, this used to matter a lot, right? For a couple of reasons. One is that most people didn't fine tune models. Most people trained most models from scratch um, until, until fast AI came along pretty much. Um, and then secondly, well, we didn't have batch norm, right? So it was totally critical. And then even when batch norm came along, we didn't know how to fine tune models with batch norm. So we just fine tuned the head. At that point, we didn't realize that you had to fine tune the batch norm layers as well. Um, so uh, I remember emailing Francois, the, the creator of Keras, and I was saying to him, like, I'm trying to fine tune your Keras model, and it's like bizarrely bad. Like, why, why is that? Like, well, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Here's the documentation, whatever. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm doing the right thing. And I, yeah, I spent like three months trying to answer this question. And eventually I realized it's like, holy shit, it's the batch norm layers. And I sent him an email and I said, oh, we can't fine tune Keras models like this. We actually have to fine tune batch norm layers, which I don't think they changed for years, um, actually. Um, anyway, so those, yeah, so those changes is why I guess um, this whole normalization layer thing is much less interesting than I guess we thought, which is why we hadn't really noticed it wasn't working before because our models are training fine. Anybody else have any uh, questions before we wrap up? All right, gang. See you. Nice to see you all. You. See Good you luck guys. with you, Nat. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.